done one problem with hard work. When you get to this, you just can't put a price on it. You just cannot put a price on it. You can't buy this. You can't buy it. Money can't buy it. It's just special. Welcome to the Rook Report podcast in association with Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen. My name is Rich Spear and we're here to talk over Sunderland's 2-0 win over Wickham Wanderers, a relatively comfortable regulation. Alex Neal win on a nice day out in London. Promotion as well from League One after four years. So we're going to have a, a bit of a chat about that. I've got with me for that Phil West. How are you this evening, Phil? And um, you didn't get to Wembley, like a lot of our listeners, you would have been uh, watching from home. Yeah, uh, you would have been kind of watching on the on the Sky coverage. I'm sure. Yeah. What was that like? It was nerve wracking. I was watching it with my dad because um, obviously he's not in the best of health, so we weren't able to get down to Wembley mm-hmm. for the game. But yeah, we watched it together. I thought Sky's coverage was really good. Actually, they had lots of angles covered. It was good to see them interviewing people like Niall Quinn before the game. So yeah, it was you know it, it was it was nerve wracking, but um, it was it was enjoyable at the same time, Rich. Yeah, they made it a bit more of a special occasion than they did the semis then, which yeah, was like absolutely. 15 yeah. minutes of, well, we had half an hour of golf, didn't we? And then we did, 15 minutes yeah. of uh, starting. I'm sure Bomber wouldn't have been bothered about watching half an hour of golf because he likes a, a good round of uh, golf. We've also got um, Bomber with us. Bomber, you had a, a bit more of the kind of traditional weekend in London. You did the mm. lot, didn't you? Yeah, mine was a bit full on, Rich. So I was, I was Trafalgar on Friday. Uh, Box Park and Wembley Saturday and then back to Trafalgar and then a three and a bit coach journey back home to Gloucester, which got me home at about two o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning. So, yeah, it was pretty full on for me. That, that is full on, going back after Trafalgar on the Sunday night. Yeah, Tom O'Brighton's fault. Um, Tom O'Brighton gets the blame for that. He twisted me arm, got me back to Traf- Trafalgar. I had a couple of hours before the bus was going from Victoria and I hadn't met him. Obviously, we've been on podcasts together. We do, we do our we do our local report thing, but never met him. So I met him in a in a Mackey's in near Trafalgar, and then we sat in Trafalgar and had a few more <laughs> beers before I literally had to run to Victoria and got onto the bus with about two minutes to spare before departure. So yeah, full on, full on. But I wouldn't have swapped it for the world. Yeah, couldn't have been more contrasting with with my weekend, which was kind of very sedate. Nice train down to London on the morning of the game. Bite to eat with my dad, who we met met in the station, and then a reasonably quiet train up to Wembley Central Station. A few, a couple of beers in a pub, which was uh, which was really rowdy and loud. And then uh, and then the match, and then we just went for something to eat after, and uh, back to the hotel because uh, I haven't been very well, so I couldn't exactly do uh, the whole kind of what Gav and Chris and Craig managed to do and we all heard about the other day. But I'm, you know, I'm really glad that everyone's getting to meet up with people. I got to meet up with uh, Chris briefly in the stands, uh, which was lovely. Again, someone I've worked with uh, on this for three years, recorded many, many hours together, uh, chatted for a long time and we did get to spend some time with each other. And we were actually, it leads on to what we're talking about today, which is the match itself. Given that uh, I don't think Gav, Craig, and Chris had uh, had even touched on it in our last pod, given the fact that they were all still a little bit uh, squiffy from the from the weekend. I was going to say I'd be very surprised if Gav could have any comment on the match afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, he was tapping me up to say how do I watch it back on now TV? <laughs> uh, I watched I watched it back last night uh, myself, and obviously Phil, you got the the full analysis on the day. Your overall impressions, Phil, of the game before we go into it in detail. I said at the beginning it was a, a regular, you know, a relatively comfortable regulation Alex Neal win, which is the the kind of the atmosphere he wanted to create around the game. Would you would you agree with that? It was very much a kind of typical typical Sunderland, new Sunderland. It was rich, yeah. And you know, these occasions are supposed to be fraught, they're supposed to be nerve wracking. The players are supposed to be like rabbits in the headlights. There was none of that. I was watching the players' body language as they were lining up for the anthems before the game. Um, we, and I love the little touch of having the names on the tracksuit tops as well, which was a really nice nod to 1973. I thought that was really nice to see. 
And you could see from the player's body language, or I could see on the TV coverage, that every single Sunderland player had belief coursing through them before that match started. Look on O'Neill's face when he looked towards our spectators and nodded. He knew what was going on. He knew that we were going to win that match, Rich. And, you know, I was contrasting that with how... Because I remember it very well when we played in the corresponding fixture in 2019 against Charlton. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching the players line up for that and they looked absolutely scared stiff, Rich. They looked as if Mm -hmm. they had no confidence, no belief. Maybe expectedly so because obviously form had dipped before that, which led them into the playoffs. This time it was completely different. Um, and I think a lot of that does come from Alex Neal. I think the belief that he's given these lads in a very short period of time as well, it's not as if he's had a great day of the time to work with them, has been absolutely remarkable. Um, he's toughened them up. He's turned them into a group of, I'd call them skillful but fragile players before he came along. Mm-hmm. He's turned them into a group of warriors now. All the skills still there, but they've got a real spine about them now. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that this, the tone was very much set before we even kicked off, to be honest with you. Um, and as for the game, you know, in summary, yes, it was a very, very, it was a ruthlessly efficient performance by us, Rich. You know, it was, you know, I, Wickham really, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, they barely laid a glove on us. You know, they really, really didn't trouble us that much, apart from one or two dodgy moments. Patterson made a good save from Vokes. Um, but, you know, when Pritchard hit that free kick early early doors and it went wide, I just got this sense that it was going to be our day, you know, to have the confidence to go for go from there. And I just felt that we were building during that game. So, yeah, for me, Rich, an absolutely classic Sunderland under Alex Neal performance. Disciplined, efficient, ruthless. Yeah, yeah, I can't I can't disagree at all. And and Bomber, just on the the kind of the 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 pre match atmosphere in the ground, it, it also seemed to have that air of confidence. I think once we were in there, or once we were even in the queues to get in, everyone kind of felt it. Yeah, did you feel the same that it was just you know, nothing had gone wrong. <laughs> you know, we'd all mm. we'd all got there for a start, and uh, apart from yeah. the, the the lads, poor lads, and the lads who didn't, whose um, bus broke down uh, near Leeds. Uh, but you know, nearly mm. everyone had got there, and 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 everything had gone okay. No one, there weren't mass arrests in Trafalgar Square the night before, and and everyone had managed to kind of haul themselves out of their their hotel rooms. And I just felt everyone around me had that same kind of confidence that possibly that Alex Neal has kind of has given the whole club. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would, I would agree with that Rich. There's and do you know what it wasn't just inside Wembley Stadium it, it, itself. The whole for me the whole experience from from even from the Friday night in Trafalgar they're just and yeah. maybe I'm speaking out of turn maybe I'm, I'm I'm sounding a bit arrogant after the fact but there just seemed to be an air that, around the place that this was going to be a celebration this was going to be a procession for us rather than you know I didn't sense there's people nervous obviously before a big game you're going to be nervous fans but there there wasn't like nervous tension and trepidation it was like I'm nervous for the game but it was like an excited nervous because for the first time in, in four years genuinely I felt an expectation that we were going to win that game and go up I was that confident um I will say that I called the two nil I called that on Friday night, um, <laughs> and I said that if we, I, I said to um, Paul that if we went one 0 up relatively early, we wouldn't concede and we'd see the game out comfortably. And I genuinely think that not everybody could, you know, everybody has has a different opinion, um, and some people are, are more pessimistic than others. And I'm I'm one who's normally claimed as being a happy clapper and a, a glass half full kind of guy. But yeah, and then you got into the got into the stadium, got into the through the the turnstiles. And everyone's singing, everyone's happy. There was there was not an ounce of nervous energy around the place, and I mm-hmm. genuinely felt like a parade um, before the game had even started. And like I say, I know it's easy to say that now that we've won it, um, but yeah, uh, it, going in there and hearing all the all the singing, seeing everybody's just the, the emotion on everybody's faces and the the expressions. Like I say, it was it was pure joy even before a ball had been kicked. It was pure joy. Talk. Yeah, um, rather than, like I say, rather than nervous trepidation. And, and I think the players fed off that. Like Phil said, Luke and I looking around and kind of nodding because he gets it. He knows what this means. And, you know, I genuinely think, I, I think we would have won the game in any case. But if there was an extra 10% that needed to be dragged out of those players, it was done, again, before a ball had even been kicked. Um, as they were lining up, you know, for the for the procession yeah. that goes on beforehand. And just to add to that before we do, go in and actually look at what happened in the game, um, which I'm sure everyone's seen. 
it for me one of the interesting things I guess was the fact that we, you know we chanted for more than 90 minutes non-stop incessantly and it was all pro Sunderland I think there was one anti Newcastle chant went round for about 30 seconds at one point and it, and it and it fizzled away all we wanted to do was support our team there was no goading of of them really mm. You know, we could have sung, you didn't sell all your tickets and all this. It just wasn't about anything other than complete and utter, unabashed, unashamed support of our club because we knew what our role was in that game, which was to make it a wall of noise and uh, to cheer our players on to victory and that and, and now else. And, and like, that was what, like, I think my abiding memory of it is, is that it was just that kind of, non-stop incessant deafening i was sat right slap bang in the middle behind the uh behind our scoreboard above our scoreboard and chris was there as well a wonderful view if you can ever get that that is a class view it's like watching like sensible soccer essentially you've got like the whole pitch in front of you it's brilliant for for, for what we're doing now which is going to look at uh, the analysis but i had it in stereo sound for the around the whole ball and it was magnificent. And I, the only, the, my only downside is because of the way the ticket allocations worked and, and the way they re, were released. My dad and my son were in the posh seats uh, <laughs> on uh, near the halfway line, and I was sat slap bang in the middle uh, above the spot, scoreboard on my own. But the people around me were lovely, and we had we had some good hugs at key moments. Uh, five complete strangers uh, <laughs> all, all dancing. <laughs> On a row, and that's what it's all about in the end, because it, it did feel like I was just plunked in the middle of a family, and and that was lovely. Um, but the match itself, and as Phil mentioned, we kind of made a flying start to the game. We were right on it from the first moments. We won a free kick right on the edge of their box. Pritchard hit a, a lovely curling shot, as has become a bit of a trademark of his. And um, Phil, I guess you knew way before many of us in the stands that that hadn't gone in yeah but as as you mentioned it did it did set the tone he's he's just got that quality on the ball where i almost expected him to to score it yeah absolutely and you know pritchard who i'm sure we'll, we'll probably touch on later but <laughs> um you know he's one of our big game players i think tom albright mentioned this in our, one of our whatsapp chats recently is that you know a key difference with alex nielsen is that the players now have the big game mentality individually and yeah. collectively um, to deliver in, in those moments. And I think that Pritchard really embodies that. And, you know, you'd have heard him give interviews, Rich, this season, and he speaks with such a such a calmness and an insight. Um, you know, a lot of us have said he's probably going to have a career in the media when he's playing days coming to an end, and I think that's mm-hmm. probably quite accurate. But, yeah, that free kick, it very much set the tone. Um, he was never going to resist the opportunity to have a dig from there. You know, that's, that's, his, that's his approach. You know, he's always going to have a go. Um, and obviously, you know, there was that kind of moment when the net rippled and we, you kind of half jumped up thinking it had scored. Uh, and then the TV room players cut to some Sunderland fans who hadn't yet realised it hadn't gone in. I was yeah. one of them. The looks on their faces. Oh, was that you? Oh. Was it Bomber <laughs> right? Okay, fair enough. And um, and then obviously it it, it, it it died down subsequently. But um, like <laughs> I said, Rich, you know, it really set the tone, I felt. Um, we made... I mean, I don't think we could have played that first 20, 25 minutes any better, really, to be honest with you. I think that the attitude we showed was bang on. You know, we needed to hit Wickham hard with intensity early. You know, we done roundtables about this earlier in the week, and one of the most common answers was, let's get at them. Let's play with pace, with dynamism, with tempo, get about them and make sure we make life uncomfortable for them. And we did that. You know, we absolutely did that. And... You know, I know there was a lot made of the mythical Wembley pitch, et cetera, et cetera, but we used it perfectly. You know, we were moving the mm-hmm. ball nicely. There was good movement on and off the ball. I think Roberts was absolutely fantastic the whole game. Just such a such a dynamic threat at all times. Um, and yeah, I, th- I think the first 20 minutes, Rich, a perfect platform. It really, really was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I mean Bomber, I'll come to you because you were one of those who, who thought it was thought it was in was probably celebrating wildly while... Uh... <laughs> While the ball was back in play, yeah, yeah. Um, in my defence, was still going on. In my, in my defence, the whole of the electronic scoreboards around, and the, the, there was like electronic scoreboards, electronic um, holding around the gap between the first and second tiers, and all of that flashed up with goal as well. It was it was goal Sunday all around that side. So everyone who had almost like a side on view, looking at um, from the end for which we were defending the first half, would have seen, we started celebrating, and then saw. 
all the electronic hoarding saying flashing up goal red, in red and white. So we all assumed it was a goal. So we're just there jumping around celebrating. Oh. Next thing you know, they're taking a goal kick and we're kind of like, oh, oh, it wasn't in then. Um, but yeah, I was one of those. <laughs> and, I, and I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone. There was a good few hundred of us that carried on celebrating for a little while longer. Definitely. Uh, like I say, my eagle eyed view, I was, I'd, I'd seen the ball bounce off the back and come back out. <laughs> and it was pretty clear it wasn't in. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it, it did set the tone and we did get the goal. I mean, Elliot Embleton picks the ball up almost by accident in, in his hour half, uh, drives inside from a kind of inside left to an inside right position across the pitch, um, takes the defender on, hits it from slightly behind the defender and their keeper managed to completely mm. um, misjudge the ball. David Stockdale, it, it hit his... Is kind of you know the top of his arm and went in. Phil, how did that happen? Was it literally just like because I've seen it back a few times? And Embleton hit that very very hard. And you know with like modern footballs, if you hit yeah. them extraordinarily hard, they can the physics of of how the balls rotate and and how they move through the air is really interesting. It looked like to me initially Stockdale was in the right position and then it moved yeah. to the right. I don't know if you've seen the same. I have, yeah. Obviously, on Sky, we got the multiple replays right off the bat. And the the, the one that really kind of um, told the story for me was the one from the camera that was directly behind the goal and just up, up, up with a height a little bit. So you kind of get like you were looking down on it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, Embleton gave the ball a heck of a thump, but it, it looked to me as if Stockdale initially had it covered. And then at the last minute, it, the ball just seemed to kind of jag in midair just off to the side a little bit and he wasn't able to adjust his body and, and he kind of threw up his arm in it and attempted to kind of like mm-hmm. obviously stop it and the, the the ball's kind of like flicked off almost his bicep really and kind of yeah. just gone and, 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 and gone into the net but I mean yeah it, it, it was a it was a poor piece of goal came and I don't think there's any doubt about that but I think you have to give Elliot Embun credit I mean that's the kind of goal that you know we used to score on, on the school playing field when all of a sudden the space just opens up in front of you and you think oh I'll keep running Oh, I keep running a bit more. Oh, there's the goal. Well, it's early doors. I'll give it a shot and see what happens, you know. And, you know, it, it, it worked out beautifully for him. I have to say, I don't think he could have scripted that any more, any any better because embleton has been criticised a bit this season. You know, he's, he's he's often been accused of being a bit of a luxury player, doesn't really produce consistently, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, that would have meant the world to him. You know, in that moment, he's living the dreams of every single Sunderland fan in that stadium. So yeah. I thought it was a great moment for him. Um, it was a well struck shot, without a doubt, and I liked the confidence he had as well to take it on in early in the game as well. You know, he thought, well, you know, if he saves it, fair enough. You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. If he makes a mistake, we're one nil up. So yeah, it was a, it was a great goal, Rich, and a great moment as well. Yeah, the, the one thing I would say ab- about it, like, is is it was some, I, I personally thought it was some quite poor defending on Wickham's part as well. You know, Elliot Embleton has done real well to pick that ball up in the middle. He's found himself in a in a load of space, broke through. And he's essentially, he's the only player forward for Sunderland at that point. And both Wickham centre-halves just drop deeper and deeper and deeper to actually allow him to keep running to the ball in, into an area where he probably fancies that he can get a shot away. And it's only at that point that the, 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 one of the centre-halves decides, oh, I better go forward to the ball. But by then it's too late. Elliot's already, you know, half wound up to lay, lace that thunderbolt towards goal. Um, I just thought a bit of communication between those two centre halves. One could have gone, one could have covered, because the only threat was Elliot Embleton, because he blitzed past everybody else and he was there on his own. The angle I was at, it just looked like he was a, the, the, the uh, keeper was a bit blindsided. It saw it a bit late. Um, I mean, it looked like on the face of it, really poor keeping. I've, like you, Phil, um, I don't know how it looked for you, Rich. Actually, behind the goal, you probably had a bit of a better view mm. of it. But yeah, having seen the replay, I'll give him a little bit more leeway behind it but I don't think Embleton should have been in a position to get the shot away in the first place but he was and I couldn't care less because it went in so yeah I mean live uh, like you say I was sat directly behind it like literally all right a long way away Mm. but directly behind it and my impression of it was one that he hit it quite astoundingly hard like he really ripped through that ball and hit it very very hard and the pace on the ball I think is what surprised Doc uh, Dave Stockdale uh, hmm. initially and I think I heard Embleton interviewed where he said that the ball did wobble after he hit it and that's what it looked like and it looked like it took that right hand kind of 
almost kind of U turn right yeah. at the last minute and to hit his shoulder. So it was a wonderful strike. It was a wonderful goal. It was well deserved. And actually, um, in terms of uh, your your bit of analysis there, Bommy, I think you're spot on. I'm just looking through uh, what. Cole Young, our analyst, uh, is, is publishing on the site in the next uh, day or two, um, probably up there now when people are listening to this, uh, and he's gone through how, how we did it and dismantling Wickham's system of uh, man-marking is how he's described it, and one of the key parts of that was Embleton and Pritchard's freedom and rotation and in- interplay, and I think that played out through most of the first 25 minutes uh, where we were really were on top, um, and added to that was uh, Roberts's runs and Stewart dropping, uh, dropping um, into midfield and letting people run past him. Which I think again he was he, he wasn't the furthest forward in that move, and I think all of that came into play where we had the ability to open up large sections of the pitch at different times, whether that was getting in behind their full backs. Um, which I think called us some fantastic analysis about how the positioning of our wide players slightly inside caused them all sorts of trouble in terms of leaving gaps in in uh, in in behind. The view I had was that we had basically the freedom of a third of the pitch at times because of how high their their fullbacks were, and there was lots of lots of good tactical points. In that, especially in that first 25 minutes where we really did nullify them. But they came into it a bit more in the, the kind of the, the, the second half of the first half, I guess, Phil. Uh, what do you think was behind them coming back? And is it just because they were a good side? I mean, you look at the possession stats overall for the game and it's about 50-50. I think they have 51% possession, but they didn't, didn't really create that much, did they? No, they weren't. They weren't. They weren't. They weren't exactly bombarding us. Um, no. I think um, McCleary was, you know, trying to make things happen. He was, you know, he was quite game. He wasn't giving up, and he was trying to get, you know, some some decent um, balls into the box. Um, but I, 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 I wouldn't, you know, yeah, they, they they did start to kind of get more of a foothold in the game. Um, I just felt we dropped off just ever so slightly. Uh, maybe a natural reaction, you know, you are one 0 up, and you know, you're trying to you're trying to play the long game. Um, but I, you know, I don't think you can be too critical of that. But yeah, that Wickham, you know, we were all kind of predicting before the game, or certainly in the run up to the game, that you know Wickham would probably try and get the ball out wide, try and put crosses in, you know, because we, you know, we struggled with set players and crosses when we played them at their place. Obviously, the three three draw at Adams Park, that was a bit of an Achilles heel for us. Um, but on Saturday, you know, we, we we dealt generally well with everything that went into the box. Really, I felt Bailey Wright and Danny Bart were really really solid. One or two hairy moments aside. And behind them, you've got Anthony Patterson, who who you know was an absolute rock, really. Um, one of the stories of the season for me, you know, a young yeah. lad emerging to take the to take the goalkeeper's jersey. Um, and I think Thorben Hoffman's a very good goalkeeper. Don't get me wrong, but the fact that Patterson has now cemented that position as his own, and for me, should be our number one next season. I don't yeah. know what you and Bomber think about that, but mm-hmm. for me, he deserves a chance. Um, I think he's got a lot of room for improvement as well. That's the impressive thing about him. Um, he's got a high ceiling, you know. This kid, he's got a very, yeah. you know, he could become a really, really great goalkeeper. But yeah, you know, getting back to what you said, Richard, I, I just felt that we just dropped off a couple of yards ever so slightly, um, and that probably gave them a little bit of hope. They say, okay, maybe they're maybe they're just slacking it off a little bit here. Let's get at them a little bit. But you know, just to reiterate, I don't really feel that they were bombarding us. I think it was just one of those little momentum shifts that you've just got to weather, you know, and we can do that well under Alex Neil. So, yeah, I wasn't too worried about it. There was that one moment, Bomber, I think, when uh, the the centre-backs got in a in a mix-up and then Lyndon Gooch tried to header a ball back to Patterson and mm. it took a, a good challenge, I think, from Bailey Wright to, to stop them having a, a, a really good opportunity. But other than that, they didn't have very much, did they? Uh, until, I guess... They came out in the second half. They played pretty well. They they, they dominated. This is Wickham dominated for for the first kind of fifteen minutes of that that second half, and then they had that one chance. Um, mm. And we are just, I think, going to have to give loads and loads and loads of credit to Anthony Patterson for what he what he did in that game, which was as good as good as a goal, wasn't it? The ball comes over to Sam Vokes from. I think Anthony Stewart played that diag. It, mm. it kind of bounced over Billy Wright's head, lands at the feet of Vokes, 
and there was Patterson. Did you think at that moment that that is when we thrown it away? I, I couldn't believe that he'd saved it. Yeah, so it was a it was very much a heart in mouth moment, wasn't it? When it, b- before the ball got to Vokes, I mean, just to just to go back a bit to before that chance, you, you're right. Wickham came out. I wouldn't necessarily. I'd say we were still pretty evenly matched, but they certainly came out with a renewed purpose and a, a and a renewed kind of urgency to to get into that game. I think they they basically tried to do in the first fifteen minutes of the second half what we did to them in the first twenty minutes of the first, mm-hmm. and just catch us sleeping a little bit. But we we were obviously more more astute and more switched on to it. I say more switched on, and I'm now going to talk about Bailey Wright missing a header and, and letting some <laughs> Sam, Sam folks in. Um, I mean, we'll give we'll give Bailey the benefit of the doubt given that his heroics in the past few weeks and given the fact that he took a helicopter down to the to, to Wembley because uh, he didn't want to infect the rest of the team. So, you know, we'll put it down to illness <laughs> for that. But to to come back to, to Patterson, you know, somebody summed it up perfectly uh, on Twitter and I can't remember who it was, so apologies. But basically, Patterson had snuffed that chance out really before Vokes realised that he was even through on goal. And, you know, the, the anticipation and the reactions of the boy to to come out because it you know it, it was it wasn't penalty spot six yard box it was only it was just inside the box by the time the ball had gone over Bailey Wright's head so he his starting position his speed off the line his anticipation his reactions all absolutely perfect and just to kind of reiterate something that Phil was saying about how brilliant just brilliant in the the two semi finals and the final in particular you know it's re- it really is a coming of age for Anthony Patterson. I had when he when he first came back off loan, I, I, I held my hands up and said I had some reservations about him, and was kind of like, well, you know, if if this is if this is the keeper that's going to be tasked with helping us get promoted, I think he might end up costing us points, and and you know, boy, have I I've been proven wrong by it because I don't know what you two think, but it, it smacks of a of a of a Jordan Pickford in his in his rise. He's gone oh. away, he's come back, he's a local lad, and you know. The, the, like like Phil said, the, the ceiling for the guy is, if he keeps developing how he's developed in this second half of the season, he's, there's a Premier League keeper there for me. Definitely. I'm, I'd quite put, happily put my neck on the line and say it. He's got all of the physical attributes as well. I think he's deceptively tall. I think he's got, you know, he's big, big hands, he's athletic, he's got great judgment, and I think he's he's added uh, a lot to his value just in that in that one in that one game through his assuredness because the way he was coming out and collecting yeah. balls and really awkward, you know, really awkward balls that like you've seen League One goalkeepers let through their hands and go into the back of the net. Yeah. And and he and he was uh, he was excellent. There's something there's just one more point, Rich. There's something and this this might be a bit of a it might be a bit of an obscure comparison. There's something of Mark Poom about him, in my opinion. In terms of his physique, as you mentioned, in terms of his, his Poom had that kind of big rangy physique about him, didn't he? Really, and I think I think mm-hmm. Patterson's similar. I'm not I'm the you know drawing comparisons between them, but they just when I watch him, I just think mm, it's not it's not it's not, a, it's not a million miles away. But yeah, as Bomber said, there is a Premier League keeper there if he keeps developing without a doubt. It's it, it's it's great, and it's great that you know we're still bringing through such talented lads at the club uh, and local local lads in there and. They're they're winning games for us in in the biggest occasions. Your Embletons, your your Patterson's. They ultimately the game the game winners in in this one. Yeah. Um, a, a, a lad who's come in from from elsewhere and taking his opportunity uh, at Sunderland is is Patrick Roberts, and he, he was uh, instrumental throughout the game. I know uh, we'll come on to it uh, in a bit, um, but um, he was given your man of the match, Phil. But he was taken down on sixty eight minutes, and I've watched this back. And that that was a pen. I w- watching it live, yeah. I thought it was a pen. Um, my position for it was was pretty. You know, I was over the top of it. It looked like he'd been wiped out by sandwich between two defenders. You look at it back; they didn't touch the ball, and they took him out. Um, well, they took him out before they touched the ball. Um, Bomber, what was your impression of of that of that incident? Did what what was your view of it? And and were you surprised it didn't go to VAR? Yeah, so that was I think that was the key thing for me. So a lot was made about the fact that VAR had been voted in for the um, for the playoff finals, and at the time, I wasn't outraged because the ref hadn't given it. And you know, if that was a League One game, I'd be throwing things at the telly, I'd be ranting and raving. But I was actually quite calm because I, was, I had Paul. I watched the game with Paul, our, 
uh, our own Roker Report, Paul. Um, and we kind of looked at each other and went, well, that's a pen. And just calmly kind of waited for VAR to do its thing and then the referee to pull it back and yeah. point to the spot. And as the play went on and it carried on and carried on and carried on, we were like, when's it going to come back? When's it? And then all of a sudden it didn't. And we were like, come on, man. Yeah. That, that, yeah. It's, if, if anything, that's what, exactly what VAR is for, for those sorts of decisions. And they've completely got it wrong. And the ball didn't go out of play again for a little while, did it, somehow? And and I was just expecting... Just, just waiting for the whistle to go. Yeah. Where, where, when the ball had gone out of play, I was right, and then he's going to stop the game. Mm. As you've seen so many times on Premier League games. And 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 it just didn't happen. Uh, so that was a, a funny one, having mm. a system in place that essentially wasn't used for the purpose that it was... It was useful, but thankfully, it didn't matter in the end. That uh, that strange non-VAR uh, decision for the for for what was a pretty obvious penalty, um, because we did get the second goal. I mean, they they threw on Hanlon, they put um, Akin Fen were on as well, um, but it didn't make it any difference really to their attacking prowess what it did do um is leave some big spaces in the middle of the pitch and down the sides we took advantage of it just before Alex Neal made the kind of the consolidating substitution of bringing Callum Doyle on for for Alex Pritchard who had been kicked around the pitch and probably looked a little bit injured by this point he still managed to play one last beautiful bit of football down the right hand side with uh, Patrick Roberts cut inside Ross Stewart dropped off his man, got a little bit of space, nutmegged their defender and placed the ball neatly into the bottom left-hand corner of the uh, of the Wickham goal. And uh, we had a little bit of a, a celebrate in the in the stadium at that point, um, Bomber. It was a, it, it was a fun moment. Yeah, it was it was a fun moment. I, I said right at the start <laughs> when we started talking that. Uh, you know, there was there was it was a joyous atmosphere, and there wasn't any tension. But if if, yeah. if there was a few in the, in there that were a little bit tense, a little bit nervous, once that second goal went in, you could just just the relief. And and again, I, I used the word so many times, just the joy that you know, there's ten minutes, yeah. however long to go, we're two nil up, we've looked comfort comfortable throughout. You always know that at one nil, it's just one mistake. You know, a Bailey Wright missed header, for example, yeah. um, from from kind of throwing it away. Um, or letting them back into it, but that second goal just it just killed them. That it completely deflated them, and we knew it was time to start popping the champagne corks and and celebrating. And you know, it, then that last ten minutes uh, uh, plus stoppages, um, you know, it it really just was a party from then on in. Um, the the, the, the it goal was. itself, I didn't at first sight. I thought Stewart had scuffed it, and again, couldn't care less because because no. it went in and we're two 0 up. But at first thought, I thought he kind of scuffed it. But on, having watched the replays and having watched the game again, it's it's actually a very well placed shot, isn't it? A lovely finish. Again, I was well placed to see it, um, and and he did just pick he picked his spot, and and Stockdale didn't really have much much chance with it. And um, like you say, that that atmosphere there. Sorry to gloat on it, Phil, because <laughs> you couldn't make it. I don't really think <laughs> what it was like in. You know, in, in for for everyone else, because there'll be lots and lots and lots of people. Like probably, you know, as many people are in the ground were were watching on on the telly as nervously and celebrating as passionately as we are. But my word, like I think it's the first time I've wanted there to be a little bit more injury time, mm. just because, yeah. like, just just because. Well, for a start, because we had another couple of chances to score goals, and I thought it would be nice to to round it off with a with, with a third. Um, but um, it was quite an unbelievable feeling, and I think joyous is the right hmm. um, is the right description. It was like somebody had had spiked everyone's hmm. drink. It was quite overwhelming, uh, which, with, wasn't it? With some, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. It was. It was really, honestly, just thinking back and talking to years about it now, because I've only talked about it, obviously, with, with my dad and my son who were there. Um, it was something else altogether. Um, but, Phil, for you back home, for you with your your, your dad watching the game, you know, it's, it's often even worse when you're not there, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is because you you feel helpless to a certain extent, you know. Yeah, you, you, you can't cheer and ever. So that must have been a brilliant moment for you and for your, for your family. It was it was rich because you know it, it, it's a it, it's it's very much a family affair with me and my dad as Sunderland supporters, and we've had our yeah. fair share of heartaches over the years as well. Obviously, you know, I remember as a kid at the you know the nineteen ninety eight playoff final, um, you know, and and you know just praying that Michael Gray would score his penalty and he yeah. doesn't, and then your heart just sinks. And then you get to yeah. the Capital One Cup final in 2014. It's your at Wembley, and then you, you don't win that one, and then the playoffs in 2019. So yeah, it was you know just when that when that final whistle went, it was just this kind of cascade of emotions. Really, we just looked at each other, and we just kind of thought, "Thank God for that." You know, we finally ended this Wembley curse in front of spectators. You know, um, but yeah, as as as, um, as as you said earlier, Rich, you know, I think that the, the last ten minutes were just complete. It was like a dare to dream kind of moment, wasn't it? It was yeah. like, we're really tuning up in a playoff final here. We're making quite light work of this, you know. We are getting promoted <laughs> back to the championship. It was so anti-Sunderland, um, wasn't it? It was, yeah. it, was, it, was the, it was the antithesis of everything Sunderland's supposed yeah. to stand for, wasn't it? You know, But um, but just on the Stuart goal, if I can just touch on that, Rich, because um, it, was, it, was, it was a really well-taken goal. And to be fair, I mean, he could have had... He had the header um, as well that he, that he yeah. just put wide of the post. Um, but the goal was really well taken, and what I loved about it was the build-up play. And you mentioned this with um, with Pritchard. That is for me where he's at his best in those little pockets of space because he's he's so nimble and so agile and able to kind of manipulate a football in such a small area. And that was a massive part of that goal. So that was really Sunderland's attack and play. In summary, it was very well worked. It was nicely nicely put together. Um, and yeah, just Stewart takes it. You know, I've always said that Stewart's deceptively good with the ball on the deck. Oh, you know, yeah. he's, he's he's a very very capable f- striker with the ball at his feet. We know he's got a good aerial game, but he's very good on the deck. Just shifts it to his right and just plants it into the corner. And then, I mean, the 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 TV replay of him running to 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 the corner and then doing the knee slide, and the fans just like trying to get near him. So I mean, that's the stuff that dreams are made of. You know, yeah. I mean. It's just just incredible, and um, yeah, the perfect end, Rich, without a doubt. It was, and you then had to sit down and write some player ratings, Phil. I did indeed, and yeah. I've been ribbing you in private about this. All yeah, right. so yeah. I don't disagree with your man of the match. I think it's a very good choice. It could have been one of many. Yeah, uh, and you and you went for Patrick Roberts with a nine, which is which is fair enough. He was really influential on the game. He was on the pitch the whole time. Um. But uh, there's two two ratings and one in particular that I want to pick you up on. Um, yeah. Luke O9 was given a six. And he was. Alex Pritchard, who was Sky's man of the match. Yeah. I think the stats they showed live were that he was first in, for um, for passes, for assists, for um, chances created, and second, yep. I think, for whole... Um, whole uh, interactions in the game, actions in the game, uh, you, you, you give him a seven. And I will hold I'll, my hands up I'll, on this one, Rich. I want I will, your explanation. I will hold my hands up. Well, for a start, I've never, in, in three years as a member of the report team, I've never once done player ratings. So it's not a bad <laughs> I've, way. I've done it once and once it's only. Not a, it's, it's, not a, it's not a bad way to kind of, to, to, to do it for the first time in Sunderland's biggest game of the season. So that was, <laughs> that was nerve wracking, but I was happy to embrace the challenge. Um, yeah, you know, without a doubt, I, I, it would have been. And so, I actually talked about this with someone on Twitter um, on Sunday who who, um, who mentioned it to me, and I said, "Well, the popular move would have been to give every player nines and tens because they've made history. They've become the first Sunderland team to win promotion through the playoffs." Looking back, and I have, I hold my hands up on this. I was a mile off the mark with Pritchard. I will hold my hands up on that. You know, I haven't watched the game back in full um, and been able to pay closer attention to him because I think when you watch it back. You, you can kind of watch it a bit more calmly and a bit yeah, more kind of objectively, yeah. so you get a you get a more kind of clearer perspective on it. Um, I'm happy to say that I got it wrong, no problems there. Um, <laughs> O'Neill, I felt that he did. He brought what O'Neill brought, which was you know lots of energy, lots of work rate, and again at real speed in 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 real time watching the game. I didn't feel he was as influential as he was in the first leg against Sheffield Wednesday, for example. Mm-hmm. But again, having watched the game back. Um, I think he, I, I should have bumped his rating up for his reaction to the tackle he made towards the end of the game when he <laughs> smashed. He should get two bonus points against. for that. Yeah, he should retrospectively his, his mark goes up for that because he smashed it into one of the Wickham players and then he gave a big roar, which to me summed up the whole day. So yeah, I'm, I, those two, I, I got them wrong. No problem with that. I hold my hands up on that. With the benefit of hindsight, of course I would have rated hey, them higher. But and it is, that's just, it is I'll awesome. save you a bit of Twitter abuse as well, Phil. And it yeah. is an ins- and, and to be fair, like having done it like once 
um, for the lads and a couple of times for the lasses. It's really, really difficult, especially yeah. when you're doing it like in the wake, when you're so emotional as well and when it's been such a blur in such a big game. Mm-hmm. So um, you, you did land the... Uh, the the, the the probably the most difficult job on Rock Report. Oh, um, that's okay. The We're most difficult do game of the most difficult game of the season to, to do, do it, it on. So well done, and uh, yeah, and just like cheers from all the editorial <laughs> team for actually like be, no be, being being on call when we were all on on the lash or at least uh, asleep in hotel rooms. If that's you know me, right. when everyone else was on the lash. No, it was it, it was really interesting actually to see that perspective on the game because. To, to put Roberts at the the head of it, I think was was a was an interesting and a very justifiable choice. Bomber, what what did you mean? Who were your kind of big standout players in that game? Uh, so the standout players for me, I hundred percent agree with the um, the man of the match, uh, Patrick Roberts. I thought whilst whilst obviously he didn't get on the score sheet, he was just mm-hmm. it's so influential in that game. Um, as much as Pritchard, I would say Pritchard probably had more of a high, more of the highlight reel, um, but having watched mm-hmm. the game a couple of times, just every time he gets the ball, he's he's what Sunderland's been missing for so long. Just a player so positive yeah. on the ball, picking it up, taking players on, um, and actually having the ability, I should say, to take players on because we've had players in the past who think they can do that and, and can't. But just <laughs> just to have that 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 class, just to just to glide past defenders and just make them absolutely petrified about him. Um, I thought he was class. I thought Stuart and and Pritchard again. We've raved over them, so I, I won't touch on them too much. But that they were both class as well. Um, I thought Corey Evans. I, I think he needs a mention as well because Corey Evans, the yeah. amount of stick that he's had since his time, uh, what's well, since his time started at Sunderland, um, the last six weeks or so, he has been an absolute behemoth. Um, and fair play to him, and I will salute him and doff my cap and everything else. Um, he's really. I think he's really turned a whole fan base around. So I think he deserves a mention as well. Um, and Patterson, obviously, for the save. Um, I could. I could speak highly of of everybody, mate. I think. I think. Um, yeah. A couple of people mentioned Dennis Serkin was quite quiet in in relation to the rest of the team and how influential they are. But you know, he won that. He won that free kick for Pritchard in the first couple of minutes by picking the ball up on the halfway line and just driving straight at the defenders. Um, I can't fault anybody, but Patrick Roberts is definitely the man of the match. And I just do want to mention that there's a certain Roka reporter who wrote an article about Patrick Roberts suggesting that our promotion would depend well on whether, how much time he has on the pitch. I don't know who that was, but he was obviously a very smart and uh, a knowledgeable individual. Um, and <laughs> some bloke called Bomber, I think, if I remember yeah, correctly. Some, I, I don't know. But who, who's some, he when he's some at strange no, sounding lad. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Just gonna just gonna shine my own medals for that for that one. But yeah. Um. Th- that side, he was he was fantastic. As were they all. But you can only have one of the ma- one one man of the match, and and it was Patrick Roberts for me, and he he thoroughly deserves it. And if if you could give if I could give five or six, I would. But um. Yeah. Patrick Roberts was just just a smidge above Alex Pritchard for me. I think uh, I I can't I can't disagree with that. I I thought Pritchard, I thought his class. Um, so somebody a, a while back made a comment that Alex Pritchard's like having a cheat code for League One. Hmm. Yeah, it shouldn't it shouldn't really be allowed. Like like it was like McGeady's first game season. Got him it? on the pitch. McGeady's first season in League One. Yeah, yeah. But the 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 player I wanted just to give a shout out to, and it's not you know. It's not no surprise for anyone who knows me has uh, heard me over the last three years. You know, talk about Sunderland. I thought Luke O Nine actually, on reflection, watching it back, was he was everywhere, everywhere where he was needed. He was, mm. you know, and and it wasn't a spectacular performance. You know, he did, he wasn't creating chances. He wasn't bombing forward. He wasn't looking to get on the end of things. What he was, he was there. At vital moments, he was there, and there is nothing more Sunderland than celebrating a tackle, yeah, yep. like you've scored a goal, <laughs> yeah. and and like you got, you just got to give, and and his, you know, the, just his whole presence at the club, he's been, he's got a lot of stick for smiling, it seems, at points, yeah. or yeah. being kind of being friendly. And being quite conscientious, and maybe you know, not drinking, and not being kind of your typical lad, he's an astounding guy 
overall for our, in our squad and and what he what he brings. Um, I think they wrote in the program. I think they quoted us in the program, saying that you know he's a player that Peter Reid would have loved, Mister mm. yeah. Sunderland. You know because he completely gets it. And you know forget he was he was against his his former club who gave him his big break in the game, yeah. but yeah. he loved every second of that. And that you know I know Nathan Broadhead said you know that's why he's come he come to the club for that moment, but that's why. Um, that's why Luke O Nine came to Sunderland to mm-hmm. get us promoted. Yeah, and um, just like massive shout out to him for for being a top bloke. I spoke to him when we did our twenty four hour live pod over Christmas for the soup kitchen. You know, he's gave, he gave up his time. He was just out of hospital after his mm-hmm. massive operation, and he gave up his time for to raise some money for yeah. for the soup kitchen. He's been a mental health ambassador. Everything about that man was personified on that pitch where he just gave his all. He was everywhere where he was needed. Yeah. And I think that's him in, to a T. He gave everyone everyone else, the players, like I say, the players who will grab the headlines, your Pritchards, your Roberts, your, your Stuarts, he gave them the platform to be able to go and grab those yeah. headlines. And I think Absolutely. I think just in, in his entire time at the club, I, I, I just want to put on record and say, I, I think he... For me, and I'm sure for many, many Sunderland fans, he is the player that I think all Sunderland fans wish that they were. If 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 a Sunderland yeah. fan was going to be a player, they'd all wish they were Luke and I. You know that passion isn't isn't can't, it can't be replicated, it, or you very very rarely see it replicated in any form of professional football. Um, yeah. It's just a class act, and I just I don't know if you were going to move on to it, Rich, but I think we we also just need a very very special mention for a certain American. Um, who's been through so much with the club, taken so much stick. And I'll, again, hold my hands up at times during the last couple of seasons. I've kind of, I've I've criticised him. I've wanted him out of the team. On the other hand, there have been time moments where where he's deserved praise, but just the roller coaster ride that man has been on um, and seeing all this post-match stuff, like the the stuff he said in his interviews and this, that and the other, um, I I think we, we would be remiss to not give a very special mention to Lyndon Gooch as well. Yeah, totally. Rich, can I just can I just pick up yeah, on what yeah. you said about Onai in there? Because you know you're right; he has taken a lot of stick, much of it ridiculously over the top. And it, I've I've always said that in this, you know, given the fact that we've been scrapping and battling to try and get out of League One for for his entire time at the club, I've always felt that attitude is as important as talent in this league. You know, you can have all the talent, but if your attitude isn't right, you're going nowhere. Onai is not the most talented footballer at the club, but what he is. He's dedicated. He's a consummate pro. He gives everything. And as you said, you know, I actually wrote an article a couple of weeks ago where I said that if we won the playoff final, O'Neill and Gooch would be the two players who deserved it because they've been there through mm-hmm. all the ups and downs, the mm-hmm. Wembley defeats, you know, the false starts, that you know, the the, the the disappointments, the heartache, and to see those two lads celebrating on that pitch on Saturday after that game, Gooch had tears in his eyes. I think O'Neill probably had mm-hmm. tears in his eyes as well. That would have moved a heart of stone. And for me, I don't think anybody could begrudge those two lads that ending, in my opinion. Yeah. And I'll just add one more thing as well, that these are they're, they're also probably the two players who a lot of the kids who support Sunderland oh, absolutely. look up to yes. as, as, as young men and, and examples of young men. I know Lyndon was, uh, my son was a mascot uh, just before lockdown. Walked out with Lyndon. He was absolutely brilliant with him. Our Tom's got a massive picture of Luke O'Nine in meeting Luke O'Nine on his bedroom wall. Loves it. You know, the suggestion last summer that Luke O'Nine might be leaving. Yeah. Upset him. And the suggestion that Lyndon might not get another con- um, contract upset him. And whatever the de- decision the club makes around um, Lyndon's future, I'm sure he'll, he'll, want, to, he'll want to contribute. Because you know he's he's been with us since since we brought him over from California, essentially, yeah. and he's grown up with us, um, grown up and and has that uh, amazing accent, which no one can quite yeah, it's strange. Isn't uh, it? <laughs> but, you know, I think it is the point in the season where we get to praise our favourite players, and and those two, I think, are absolutely right to oh, absolutely. to 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 pick out. Now, um, I think I'm, I think we're going to leave it there. I think there's a load more we can talk about in summing up what Alex Neal's done. I think we touched on it earlier. Um, the whole season, you know, the ups and downs, the ins and outs, the League Cup run, the 
everything we've been through as a club um, since since early August. Uh, we'll probably come back and talk about that uh, later in the week or maybe you know at the weekend. Um, but I just want to say um, thanks to everyone for listening to us today. Uh, thanks to everyone who went to Wembley and everyone who watched and listened um, from afar as well because, you know, I, I'm sure that the, the, the squad um, were very well aware that there was lots of people who couldn't get tickets as well or couldn't because mm. of personal circumstances like yourself, Phil, couldn't make it down. Um, there's loads and loads and loads of stuff to um, read on the website, rotereport.com. Um, loads of analysis uh, calls, uh, analysis piece uh, goes in depth in exactly how we achieved that um, routine win, as I described it at the beginning. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I also wanted to ask if if anyone out there wants to share their thoughts and experiences about the game, um, kind of tell us your weekend experiences and email us at the, the usual address and we can publish them as a letter or as a fan's corner blog. Uh, we've got a couple of months uh, before the season starts, so plenty of opportunity to get your voice out there on rokereport.com. Uh, just leaves me to say um, thanks for joining us this evening, Bomber. Pleasure, mate. Pleasure. Really enjoyed speak, talking about it again. Brings back all the all the emotions, and I got quite passionate talking about some of the some of the things that happened on there. So yeah, I, I could talk about it to death. So thank you. Yeah, totally. No, no worries. And thanks a lot, Phil, as ever. And again, thanks from uh, the rest of the editorial team for your cover that yep. you that you provided the, uh, last week. Like I said, if you know, sharing these moments with your mates, you know, because that's we are mates at Roker Report. I consider right. you guys to be friends as well as everybody else. It makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it? So it's been absolutely, right. it's been a hell of a week without a doubt. It has. So um, yeah, enjoy everyone. Just keep basking in the the afterglow of of the weekend, man. It it's it, it doesn't happen very often. It hasn't happened in my lifetime winning at Wembley. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll keep shouting about it. Absolutely class. So thanks a lot, everyone, and we'll speak to you all later. Ta-ra. Right.